For more than four decades, I've pondered the writings of Max Weber on the economy. And I continue to find much wisdom in his ideas, especially about the melancholic productivity of the Calvinist man of business. So my thoughts about debt today also owe much to Weber, both to his writings and to his ghost. The main idea that Weber offered to those in his own times and to his readers since then was in his famous essay on the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. Uh, and it was that, uh, was that the, uh, the evolution of the idea of money making in the, uh, in the West, the methodical pursuit of capitalist profit making, the methodical key word for Max Weber, uh, was a unique development whose main source was the uncertainty of bourgeois Calvinists about their own salvational status. The surest way to feel confident that you are on the right side of an already made divine decision was to display the virtues of methodical discipline in the form of sober profit making. The elected Calvinist soul was a practitioner of profitable double entry bookkeeping, which I think uh, Emmanuel brought up very early today. I do not plan to address the numerous debates, revisions, applications, and implications of this line of Weberian thinking today. Um, I take it rather as an argument to think with, whatever its empirical weaknesses, and would like to show that the horizon of salvation, of redemption, of, and of the mysterious workings of grace remain today an essential part of the apparatus of finance. So to make this proposal or argument uh, requires a, two steps, at least in my paper, in my talk today. The first is a general characterization of the ethos of contemporary finance. The second is a discussion of the soteriology of debt. That's in the title, Life After Debt. So I come to that second. So this part on the ethos of uh, contemporary finance is I call the dream work of speculative capitalism. Capitalism normally considered the zenith of scientism, techno-rationality, and calculative reason can fruitfully be seen as just the opposite of these things. It can be considered the dream work of industrial modernity. It's magical, spiritual, and utopian horizon in which all that is solid melts into money. Speculation is the motor of this dream work, and in this section, of course, I draw inspiration from such diverse thinkers as Ernst Bloch, Walter Benjamin, and Fred Frederick Jameson, all of whom have seen in capitalism the makings of a new eschatology and a new magical imaginary. Capitalism transforms the meaning of speculation, which has always been a part of mercantile behavior, even in pre- and non-capitalist economic orders. It does so in several ways. To begin with, it does so because, as Marx famously pointed out in his MCM formula and in his brilliant discussion of the difference between the miser and the capitalist, the capitalist, in his never ceasing pursuit of exchange value, never allows money to terminate in the purchase of commodities, but always throws money back into circulation in order to increase, create increased or surplus value. In this very act of throwing money back into circulation without seize and by refusing to hoard money at any stage of its life in the circulation of quantities, the capitalist is first and last a speculator. That is a person who is always making a wager on the positive risk of throwing money into circulation in spite of the uncertainty of such a move. The entrepreneur who was not clearly distinguished from the capitalist producer by Marx, but only clearly later by Joseph Schumpeter, always relies on another form of speculation. That is, the entrepreneur relies, that is the speculation of the capitalist investor who seeks returns on his investment without ever getting rid of uncertainty. Insofar as investors never succeed in reducing all uncertainty to calculable risk, they are always and everywhere speculators, explorers of the uncertain and the unknown. In addition, given the compulsion towards growth 
in production capacity, in market share, in profits, and thus generally in scale in industrial capitalism, there's always a pursuit of the periphery of the known market in terms of new technologies, new consumers, new labor forces, and new geographies for raw materials. And we've seen a lot of that talked about today. The dynamism of capital thus lives, in a way, at its periphery. Put another way, the economy, at least in a certain neoclassical perspective, this is again uh, written before hearing Annie's uh, lovely talk, might seek equilibrium, but the capitalist always seeks disruption. Speculation about new markets, new products, new technologies, and new efficiencies is the principal source of such disruption. This sort of disruption, now a central mantra of business journals and corporate propaganda, is the normalized expression of Schumpeter's famous dynamic of creative destruction. In this sense, too, speculation is at the driving heart of capitalism and not its magical other. Speculation thrives in the zone where the invisible and the invisible come together. Though capitalism depends on the production of both absolute and relative surplus value through the commoditization exploitation of wage labor, one of the big lessons uh, of Marx, from Marx, it rests its legitimacy on disguising, obscuring, and denying the true source of surplus value so that it can be harvested by the capitalist rather than by the laboring classes. On the other hand, the urge towards expanding its scale and scope drives all capitalist ventures and the system as a whole closer to the zone of the invisible, the most profound location of which is the future. Capitalist calculation is an endless effort to make the invisible future, the invisible future visible in the numerical symptoms of the present. Charts, figures, estimates, trends, patterns, probabilities. And there's great work, for example, by uh, Alex Prader on what he calls chartism. Uh, so there's technical work and all, but I'm, I'm just moving quickly and not doing a proper citing job here. This effort inevitably falls short of its aims to make the future entirely visible and is the primary site of competition between firms managers and investors as they choose to put, as they choose where to put their money back into play, in Marx's sense, in the endless circulation implied by MCM. In other words, the key to success in the endless battle between competitors and capitalist economies is to see competitive advantages in the realm of the invisible, rather than in the all too visible and calculable present. Since the future is always bigger than the numer numerical tools that are used to predict it, there's not only a space, but also a compulsion to enter the zone of speculation and divination in order to grow, and growth in capitalism is the condition of survival. This is all, of course, stuff that we've talked about and touched on today. It is this zone of speculation and divination uh, the sine qua non and not the other of capitalist formations and mentalities which invites the trope of dream work. I should say as just a little footnote, I remember when I was a graduate student at University of Chicago in the uh, early 70s and was first introduced systematically to Marx Weber by a very horrible man called Edward Schills, a really hateful person, uh, but who knew had translated Weber also many other things. Uh, I wrote something uh, trying to pursue the question of magic and science and so on, and I realized at that time something which I still hold on to in an otherwise tediously graduate student paper, which is that the Calvinist methodical life was actually the site of a divinatory action from which election could be construed, that is whether you were saved or not. In other words, the, the whole of your life became something like the bones and so on that were read in technical divinatory practice. So it was not at all to me wrong-headed to say that something like divination is involved because in fact it's just more systematized, more methodical, more sober, but is no different than the uh, practices of divination known to anthropology lab. So the idea of dream work, which of course I hesitate now with Eric in the audience, but it's too late now, gotta keep on going. 
brings together in its two key elements, the space of fantasy, speculation, and the unbridled imagination, which are key semantic associations with the notion of dreaming, and the space of productivity, discipline, and instrumentality, essential elements of the modern conception of work. Dream work, of course, uh, is nevertheless not, neither an oxymoron nor a contradiction in relation to capitalism. Capitalism is fundamentally, one might say, about disciplined dreaming, about playful calculation, and about speculative productivity. It is visions of growth without limit, of innovation as habit, and of risk as something to be exploited and not only to be hedged against. Capitalism is always a dream about future value, a stage for negotiations between the visible and the invisible, a procedure for the disruption of routine, and a set of rules for the always expanding realm of the unruly and the unruled. Speculation, divination, fantasy, and dream work, even apart from the core practices of financial players in the Euro-American world, something on which I and others have written, are to be found everywhere also, this is a further supplement, in the space in which information technology, social media, and big data come together, a space which can safely be seen as the next frontier in which the standard operating procedures of capitalism seek to reinvent themselves. Some key words, as we all know, of this new economy are mime, cloud, meme, interface, code, algorithm, and pattern. It does not require much thought to see that this is not the vocabulary of normal capitalism, but of its current divinatory edge, which seeks to plumb, analyze, and then monetize the trillions of bits of information that are being produced every day, thus driving the need for machinic powers of truly Promethean proportions to profit from the study of them, or the deployment of them. Blurring the lines between human and non-human agencies, between users and makers, between what I might jokingly call selves and selfies, between crowds and hordes, masses and classes, the world of big data can best be seen as the newest scene of Marx, of what Marx called primitive accumulation, at the very heart of contemporary capitalism in the West. In other words, to mine data and to make all forms of human interaction and sociality, or at least those available to capture by machines, available for monetization, the heart of the strategy of Facebook, Google, Yahoo, and as hundred smaller imitators of these giants, is the newest form, in my view, of primitive accumulation. I should make a small promotional statement here, or not just my behalf, but uh, uh, my uh, co-author, that I have a little book with uh, a, a younger colleague, a brilliant younger colleague called Netta Alexander, uh, with the single word title, Failure. And it's a very short book. It's only about 30, it's a polity book. It'll come out in about six months. I refer to it because some of our, we have a joint discussion of the way that, let's say, Wall Street, in the ways that I have some sense of, meets Silicon Valley and streaming and Netflix and things like that, which I don't know that well, but she knows very well. So I mention this for anybody who might want to uh, hear or read some further thoughts on the monetization, for example, that Netta brought up to me and showed me and, and uh, taught me about, which is, uh, in a phenomenon like buffering, you know, where you see the little circle going around and around and you're going nuts. But the last thing you do is that, to say something is wrong. There you're always trying to reboot, do this, do it. In other words, just my problem. Now it turns out, this is news to me, I don't know, maybe you all know this. Buffering and that kind of frustrated, self-blaming waiting is itself monetized. So that timing is now understood. What to do with that dead time, which makes us all hate and abuse ourselves, is also being thought about. So, so this is a truly uh, terrifying horizon, and she has many such uh, examples about streaming and buffering and uh, similar things. So what I have said so far, this is Netta, N-E-T-A, Alexander. What I have said so far might account for the viewpoint of the makers and the shakers, the heroes and villains of global capitalism, but what about the rest of us? the consumers, the users, the borrowers, the debtors, the bottomless financial proletariat. To understand the subjectivity of, let's call it, the ordinary financial citizen, which covers a very large set of classes and types, as we've again seen today, 
we then need to do what my second step, which is to look at what I am calling here life after death. Again, a phrase that we've heard today, so I'm so glad it resonates. Uh, so I now turn to talking about life after death, uh, properly speaking. So everyday life is linked to capital today, not so much, I think, by the mechanism of the surplus value of labor, very the most, I think, important, subtle, technically difficult part of three volumes uh, of, capital, of uh, Das Kapital, whose, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, so everyday life is linked to capital today, not so much by the mechanism of the surplus value of labor, brackets marks, but through making us all risk bearers, whose aggregate risk can be endlessly combined and recombined to provide new forms of risk taking and profit making by the financial industries. Now that argument alone, uh, it can be spelled out easily. It's in my work, it's in the work of many other people that the whole of contemporary finance rests on debt of a thousand types, including sovereign debt, but also plastic debt, shopping debt, medical debt, loan debt, etc. I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. Ordinary debtors remain believers in the debt credit machinery even when it fails them repeatedly. And this is what we're interested in this little failure book also. So we are all laborers now regardless of what we do insofar as our primary reason for being that is under the regime of capital is to enter into debt and thus be forced to monetize the risks of health, security, education, housing, and much else in our lives. And of course, we can go back to earlier people like Ulrich Beck who pointed out how risk came to be. The frame within which all these things were not only constructed or construed, but produced. So that now that is the way health is. It's not a matter of there's some narrative and we have a choice uh, about it. So the, this labor, and I use this seriously uh, uh, as perhaps a strong metaphor, not a weak metaphor, this labor of debt production is inconceivable without the normalization of failure and that too at several levels. First, we have to assume and absorb our regular failure to live within our means. And thus, we have to view debt as a natural fact. Second, we have to accept that some of us will go bankrupt. Bankruptcy arises. And that this is an acceptable outcome in the bigger scheme of things. I now should say an attractive outcome in the bigger scheme of things. Third, in, the, in this order of things, we learn to accept that some banks, hedge funds, and financial schemes will also fail. And with them, the dreams and hopes of those who invested in them. And finally, we learn to accept that the risk and the lived experience of failure constitute the price of entry into an inevitably deferred state of wealth, security, and happiness. Today's financial capitalism, which Marx could not have entirely foreseen in his day, does not primarily work through the making of profits in the commodity sphere, though a certain part of the capitalist economy, of course, still operates in this sphere. By far the larger portion works by making profit on the monetization of risk, and risk is made available to the financial markets through debt in its myriad forms. Now there's a ton of documentation of this and the only debates are whether global, the global value of the total of the derivatives market is five or six times global GDP. The debates are not is it more, it's how much more. Um, so the uh, documentation is very strong on this. At one time this was talked about as services outstripping goods. Now it's not a matter of services, it's a matter of the monetization of risk by endless derivation, that is derivative instruments. That market, by the way, is still growing. It's back in excellent shape after the collapse. So <laughs> the need to study it is only more urgent than it was in 07, 08. All of us, uh, so by far the larger portion works by making profit on the monetization of risk. And risk is made available to the financial markets through debt in its million forms. Here again, you know, I and others have written about this, but this history goes back to Frank Knight before whom the risk uncertain distinction was not very clear, he made it very clear. And you might say that uh, the entire financial uh, industry or industries, as well as the theorizing, Merton Scholes, Morrill, Nobel Prizes, et cetera, is entirely rests on the foundation of risk versus uncertainty. And everybody in finance would tell you, you know, uncertainty we can't do much about. Risk, not 
That's where we come in. That is some kind of numerical operation. But the rest is a, a miasma of unknownness for even the most arrogant players in finance. So there's a sizable, some of this has a sizable empirical uh, foundation. All of us who live in a financialized economy generally get in many forms, spoken about many times today, through fiction as well, I'm, I'm happy to see. Consumer debt, housing debt, health debt, and others related to this, to these. Capitalist forms also operate through debt, since borrowing on the capital market has become much more important for large corporations than issuing stock or equity. So one of the first things I learned when I started trying to understand finance is that stock market is a tiny thing. It's bonds, which we all thought were dead things that hardly moved, that were the, the game. And then, of course, derivatives based on those. The notion that the big banks responsible for the mortgage collapse of 07, 08 were too big to fail also raises the question of temporality and of the staging of emergency in the dominant financial discourses of our times. The big banks are often argued to be in need of being broken up or reorganized by voices both within and outside the financial industries, but not yet, not now. So it's the Augustinian approach to chastity is applied to always to this. Yes, but not yet. This is a particularly painful paradox because it is in the moment of crisis that banks reveal their greed for profit, their willingness to take risks with other people's money, their indifference to regulation, and their bottomless belief I say banks here sometimes is a short form for hedge funds for the whole set there, but saying them all at the same time is not so great. And their bottomless belief in the importance of what they do for capitalism as a whole, and I'm gonna say more on that in a second. And yet this is the very moment in which they're able to argue that they cannot be reformed, restricted, or regulated because that would lead us over the edge into an apocalypse from which there's no possible return. They said it, they said it clearly again and again, don't go there. Thus the now, the now of regulation and reform is deferred into a perpetual then or later, and the later never comes because the habitual cycle of debt, interest, risk, profit, and failed promises reestablishes itself, and I think bankruptcy is probably a part of that menu or cycle. After a little bloodletting of weak banks, layman, for example, and some mild punishment of the greediest corporate actors. Indeed, the promise machine, again a phrase that Netta Alexander and I use in this little book on failure, of the derivative center and market has been more or less fully restored since 2008. And a decade later, the biggest banks, hedge funds, and mega investors are making more obscene profits than ever. The household debt in the world, consumer debt, household loans of every type, mortgages, insurance, etc., appears to be, and I've looked at a lot of numbers, roughly speaking, a kind of modal number is about 12% of the world's total debt. But this number is a bit misleading since governments, go to sovereign debt about which I don't know enough, business corporations and financial institutions also depend on investments and payments from the general public as taxpayers, shareholders, bondholders, investors, small and large, and so on. In this sense, all debt, I think it's fair to say, is consumer debt. But let us concede anyway that 12% of the world's debt is directly produced by consumer borrowing and the rest by indirect extraction from consumers of every degree of wealth. Too big to fail can be better translated into the proposition that no one is too small to fail, as debtors will likely see their personal economies crash unpayable consumer loans, burdensome student loans, of beautifully, uh, the last slides we saw, lovely fictionalized accounts of that, unaffordable uh, insurance policies, ballooning second mortgages, bankrupted pension funds, the list is long. So that the major financial players in banks, pension funds, and other hugely leveraged financial institutions can remain too big to fail. As long as we keep failing in all the other areas, they can be too big to fail. Thus, in the financial markets, the ordinary citizen, the quotidian producer, that is the proletarian, of debt value is systematically doomed to be exploited by the tiny financial elite. This is a guaranteed failure whose continued reproduction is routinely represented as the main condition of the success of the global financial market. 
So how is this normalization of debt production accomplished? Because it's pretty miraculous. When you consider its, its experiential qualities, how it's been normalized is amazing. It is accomplished by a complex apparatus of financial news, expert reports by central bankers and policymakers, promotional texts from banks, financial analysts, and marketeers, and by the incessant chatter of social media in which the pleasures of debt-driven consumption and new product hysteria are maintained at a high pitch. All this news information is a vast machine for the reimagining of debt as a salvational technology. And there is now fine work on many pieces of this, including uh, the work of my colleague, who, whose name am I going to? Economy of Words, a great work on central banking. Uh, and there's other work on financial analysts and major Swiss banks, which tell you all about the narrative construction of the picture of the economy that is done by middle-level analysts in Deutsche Bank, Swiss Bank. So it's storytelling. That's what they tell clients. This is how it is the alternative. First, there was a car. You know, that's what they that's what they do. That is their business. And then, they, therefore, there's a decision: buy, they sell that. But the thing is itself a story. So there's excellent work emerging in this area. Debt is about the ever-receding tomorrow, which has a complex temporal architecture. In the near term, time becomes the discipline. Again, the issue came up many times today. Time, space, I think, in Frederick's uh, terrific paper. Uh, in the near term, time becomes the discipline of periodic payments, of accumulating interest, of juggling creditors and credit cards, of borrowing, essentially, from Peter to pay Paul. We all now live in this purgatory of plastic. In the medium term, this is a temporality of consumer pleasure, of tools, toys, experiences, and services purchased and enjoyed by the incurring of debt. So Uber, the whole world of convenience apps is that medium term pleasure. Working, it's great, serves me well, great. This is the temporality of debt-induced gluttony in which consumption offers a plateau of thingly pleasures. But these pleasures are always short-lived as objects become obsolescent, fashions change, attention shifts, and new promotional additions are advertised and marketed. This process in which debt goes quickly from pleasure to boredom to pain requires a larger eschatology, a longer horizon of redemption and salvation in which the production of quotidian debt is secured against the pain of endless payments. This is where life after debt requires to be imagined and installed in popular consciousness. And there are key, three key elements to the architecture, that is this installed architecture, of life after death. The first is the eternal life of capital. Derivative uh, from an obviously Christian genealogy, in my view, capital, with a capital C, is the spirit with a capital S, and the spirit is eternal. Though Marx famously saw the commodity fetishized as the mystification of the material relations of production, in truth, I think we could say that the foundational narrative of modern capital is of the spirit that lives through all the wear and tear of materiality, that adds value to mere labor, that imbues products with meaning, that sanctifies the profanities of money. Since capital is spirit in the Hegelian sense, the moving force behind history, it is worth reclaiming to some extent, from its demystification by Marx. In other words, Marx move on Hegel was very important, but we may now want to ask whether the Hegelian move about spirit was totally wrong-headed. So I have a little thing here from actually Wikipedia, because I was trying to check something about Geist, which I've often looked up, but I see this very juicy thing. German Geist, this is a straight quote, masculine gender, continues old high German Geist, looks the same to me, but attested as the translation of Latin spiritus. It is a direct cognate of English ghost from a West Germanic Geistas. Its derivation from a P-I-E, I don't know whether it's root, Geist, G-H-E-I-S, to be agitated, frightened, suggests that the Germanic word originally referred to frightening as an English ghastly, apparitions or ghosts, and may have also carried the connotation of ecstatic agitation, furor, related to the cult of German mercury, Germanic mercury. As a translation of biblical Latin spiritus, uh, spirit breath, the German, Germanic word acquires a Christian meaning from an early time, notably in reference to the Holy Spirit, Old English, se halga gast, 
the Holy Ghost. Uh, der Heilago Geist. Modern German, der Heilige Geist, etc. The English word is in competition with the Latinate spirit from the Middle English period, but its broader meaning is preserved well into the modern period. Now one could do, others here could do a much better job on this little dense package of uh, uh, meanings and words, but to me it, it offers some justification for some serious thinking about the idea of the spirit uh, and where it can help us. Today in the age of finance capital, I'm referring to my own voice, where value is found in the buying and selling of, of, of uh, instruments based on futurity, speculation, and volatility, the Hegelian sense of spirit, which I keep writing with capital S, may be helpful to recall. It is a key to the laws of inheritance, investment, appreciation, and speculation, none of which could function without a sense that capital is the supreme form of the eternal. This sense of capital is encouraged in the key ideologi ideological axiom of finance capital, which was also mentioned today and which I've been pondering for several years, which is the doctrine of liquidity. The word came up today, I forget exactly when, in a nice discussion. This doctrine is based on the idea that some assets are more easily converted to cash than others and are thus more liquid than others. All capital in the age of financialization strives for liquidity and the foundational leg legitimation principle of the major ideologies of banking, trading, and securitization is that they are the instruments and institutions that enable liquidity. That's the end. There's no further. That, that is what they do. It's like the trinity. That, that's it. There's nothing to be said after that. From this point of view, the key to contemporary capitalism, which is a system which enacts the bodily life of the spirit of capital, is liquidity the ability to melt all solids into the liquid form of cash. And this is where debt comes in. I'm almost done. So debt is the name of the search for liquidity among ordinary people in their roles, all of us in other words, and millions of others, as students, workers, insurance buyers, loan seekers, mortgage holders, medical service customers, and shoppers of every type. Without entering into debt, we cannot be any of these things today in the age of debt as a link between the money we have and the money we need or want. That's debt, the link, the bridge. And debt depends on the eternal life of capital and the endless promise that debt can be piled on debt and that the day of reckoning can be indefinitely postponed. Debt is also written, rewritten in the major narratives of neoliberalism as a kind of sacrificial act in which we pay interest to preserve the larger cosmos of buying and being. As with sacrifice, there is an exchange between a humble sacrificer, Morse of course has had great things to say about this, and the all-powerful receiver of what Bataille called the accursed share. The accursed share is the waste and excess generated by any economy or society that part of any economy which is destined either to be spent luxuriously uh, and without gain in the arts and non-procreative sexuality in spectacles and sumptuous uh, monuments or in outrageous and catastrophic outpourings. This is Bataille, war, sacrifice, and religion. Debt unites, now I give my read from Bataille, the excesses and waste of the 1% with the petty credit slavery of the 99% wrapping them both in an ideology of eternal life, sacrifice, and redemption, all anchored in the capitalist spirit of capital C, capitalism. The soteriology of capital links the little debt to the larger liquid spirit, the small debtor to the big trader through what I've elsewhere been uh, called the promise machine, the idea that a seamless world of utility, pleasure, convenience, and happiness is almost in our hands provided we make the next payment, the next sacrifice, the next upgrade, and the next liquid offering to the restless spirit of capital. Thus do we tolerate our mortal burdens and hope to find redemption in the guarantee of life eternal after death. Thank you.